All right. Make you presenter. Okay. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay. Um, this is a few cases this week. Um, this first case is a case of a patient who had a, had a history of um, iatrogenic esophageal perforation, and you can see the esophageal stent that had to be placed um, after that and after multiple um, um, esophageal uh, strictures that resulted. And um, an echo uh, was done, echocardiogram was done, um, looking for a possible source uh, for um, for um, what they thought was an endocarditis. He was um, growing positive uh, strep cultures. Um, I think it was strep mitis um, from blood. And uh, an echo was done that actually was transthoracic echo and was negative for any sort of uh, vegetation, um, any cause of endocarditis. But this chest CT was then subsequently done looking for any sort of infected uh, collection in the chest. Um, I noticed as I was reading this that the uh, mitral valve down here um, doesn't look normal. So you can see that um, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is, is uh, thickened and there's this globular area of low attenuation along it. And this is much more than can be explained with, for, you know, by just motion alone. And here's the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, of course. So we suspected that based on this that this patient's source may be the um, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Now, obviously, I mean, uh, transesophageal could, could not be done um, because of the, the stent and the esophageal problems, but they went ahead and, um, because it was important to find a source for them, um, they went ahead and did an um, intracardiac um, echo, and um, they found that, indeed, there was a mitral valve abscess, um, and um, they actually found an aortic valve vegetation as well that uh, I did not uh, see on this. Um, their, their prior echo, I forgot to mention, had had um, um, some mitral insufficiency and aortic insufficiency, um, and um, they finally confirmed the, this finding of the uh, mitral valve uh, vegetation that we suspected on the, um, the chest CT. So I thought it was a nice case of how um, you really uh, need to look, uh, you know, hard along the valves, especially in these cases where you have suspected endocarditis and, and just a you know slight amount of thickening it turns out. To turn, turn out to be a vegetation, um, but uh, just a, a pretty uh, dramatic example there. Um, here is just a case, um, another case. This is a young patient. Can you see my screen here? Not now. What do I? Let me, uh, let me make sure that we can do this. Okay. Okay. This is a um, young patient in the 30s who has a significant history of uh, smoking. And came in with a uh, pneumothorax. You can see the chest tube. You can see the residual pneumothorax. You can see some uh, some blood, some emphysema um, at the apex, and then on the um, at the, the right lung apex. So the left lung apex, you see some large bullae. Um, as you come down, though, you can see that the uh, the lung is uh, dramatically different in attenuation, um, with what looks like um, you know diffusely low attenuation, and then areas of central ovular emphysema scattered throughout there. And um, as you look centrally, you see that uh, there are bronchi that are filled with um, some debris there. And uh, as you look, um, you can't connect those bronchi with um, the, uh, the left uh, main bronchus. Um, so the left upper bronchus apparently is um, atretic and um, it looks like there's geographic um, 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 low attenuation throughout the remaining lung, the affected lung. So this presumably is a um, case of uh, bronchial atresia um, on, onto which um, a smoking-related emphysema is sort of inter, um, interposed or superimposed here. So hey, Brad, this is very interesting. Don't yeah. you think that looks more like, I mean, I agree with the bronchial atresia, but that disorganized cystic lung looks like a giant CPAM, which we've seen in hybrid, because the other lung's too normal-looking. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I wondered um, as I read this whether the lung was overly affected by um, the patient's uh, uh, smoking and emphysema because of the bronchial atresia, or you know, alternatively, yeah, this could represent a large um, CPAM. But I, I guess when I, I looked at this, I wondered if you know some of these areas were actually you could almost see the you know the central dot sign, and you can see the vessels sort of coursing through this. So I, 
But I'm notice, not sure. I think it, but notice how the lung that's not involved, like anteriorly, is perfectly normal. Right, right, right. I mean, it's it has some uh, the uh, the left lung, the right lung here. I mean, I thought I uh, we had some some emphysema up here, um, but you're right. I mean, it's it is much more normal. Um, you can see a little bit of emphysema up here, and then some paracetamol emphysema, and some mild central ocular emphysema. So you're probably right. This is probably you know, this may be a, a collision lesion of two congenital things, but I just think it's it's interesting how um, you know you do have some emphysema over here. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, what would would everyone vote for that? The um, notion of a, a CPAM and, and bronchial atresia collision lesion. Yeah, I agree with Jeff. I think it's probably just a hybrid, one of these mixed congenital lesions. Yeah. Okay. Also, very interesting. Uh, you know, parents uh, here. So, okay. So let me go on to this one. This is more of a curiosity uh, than anything else. And this is a patient with um, a uh, bone marrow failure syndrome, and um, it's being billed as a uh, mild dysplastic syndrome variant. And you can see that there is um, not seeing anything yet. Oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> You can see that there is um, a low attenuation blood pool here with some, you know, anemia. Um, and uh, just the interesting thing here, not only the liver is high attenuation here, the spleen is enlarged, um, but also um, down here, these high attenuation things around the porta hepatis um, are, actually, uh, are actually lymph nodes. And so very high attenuation lymph nodes in the setting of, of a um, mild dysplastic-like syndrome with chronic uh, transfusions causing not only high attenuation liver, but also um, these really, really, really high attenuation uh, portahepatitis and lymph nodes, presumably because they're, you know, draining the liver. And uh, there, I, I haven't really seen that many dramatic cases like this, but you know, there are a lot of published cases of, of similar uh, findings. So, um, have you all seen these, uh, this particular distribution of uh, lymph nodes in this iron overload? No. So people have described um, iron deposition within lymph nodes like that. Yes, yes. I was I was surprised because I haven't really seen this uh, before. Yeah. So it almost looked like it was surgical uh, when I looked at it at first, but it's actually not. I mean, these are these are um, lymph nodes. <laughs> so, Brent, Brent, there was one case. I think it was at Grady of a patient with sickle cell disease who had similar looking lymph nodes that we thought was the same thing from iron and transfusions. I'll try and pull it up. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. That's that's very oh. interesting. I wasn't uh, looking for EMH. Was there by any chance? You didn't see any, any marrow having escaped? Nothing paraspinal in the chest? Uh, no, um, let's go back here. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't remember seeing any, and I don't see any here. Mm -hmm. So, just a sort of a curiosity. Um, okay, and then um, let me show this this last one. Uh, this is a uh, young 29-year-old uh, patient who um, had. You're, uh, you're invisible. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's really annoying for me not to remember. Okay. All right. So um, this is a 29-year-old patient who um, came in for a cardiac MR for aortic um, stenosis, and um, the aortic valve was abnormal on the echo. And here you can see that there is abnormal thickening of the um, valve leaflets, and there's also some, uh, you know, acceleration um, across the aortic valve, um, suggesting stenosis, and also um, a regurg uh, jet jet here. And let's take a look at um, some other images here. So here is the um, aortic root view showing uh, that the valve is stenotic, and there's also a jet of insufficiency. Um, and the interesting thing here is that it's not just a typical case of aortic stenosis. Um, let me show you some sending through the, through the valve here. So uh, the, the valve here is, is very abnormal. You can see that the opening is on this little area right here. And um, the, uh, there, there are two sets of leaflets that are fused here. So the, this is the non-coronary uh, sinus. And so the 
um, the right sinus and the non-coronary, the, the right leaflet and the non-coronary leaflet are fused right there. And then there's fusion here between um, the uh, the right and the left right here. So you, in effect, have a um, unicuspid aortic valve here that has just this uh, single opening. So um, in, in other images I didn't show you, but um, this is a patient with a um, aortic um, aneurysm. And so you can see the aneurysm right, right there. So um, this is just a uh, interesting case of a, a unicuspid, in effect, aortic valve. So I think I'll stop there. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I'll stop there for okay, this thanks. one. Thanks, Brett. All righty, who'd like to go next? I can go, Jeff, if you want. That would be great. All right. Let's start with this one. This chest radiograph is not how this case started, but I'll show this one for fun. And the finding is really subtle, but let me show you on the lateral projection here. And I'm going to zoom up in the area of interest, which is right here. And I mean, unless you did this, you wouldn't see it on a preoperative radiograph, but I'll show you in a moment that the items of interest are these round little round nodular things in this portion of the chest. Of course, they're superimposed on the heart, but there are a couple of round objects there. So let me show you the <coughs> images in this person with a known lesion in the mediastinum that was diagnosed before as some kind of granulomatous lesion on a biopsy, but I think it was not a great biopsy sample, so there's been uncertainty about the diagnosis for some time. But the symptoms of dysphagia and some other ill-defined symptoms are getting worse. So here you can see the lesion in the lower mediastinum adjacent to esophagus. You can appreciate now that there are these calcified structures associated with it, are very consistent with flea bullets. This lesion is really intimately associated with the esophagus, not separable from it, but in that portion of the mediastinum. <coughs> Excuse me, so that's the lesion, but it's not, a, it's not a granulomatous lesion. Those calcifications are not typical of a granulomatous process. So here is some endoscopic findings here. And you can see the description of it being not typical for a malignancy surrounding one half of the esophagus, calcifications, very vascular, innumerable small blood vessels, um, consistent with a vascular lesion, as you can see there. Um, at the time of surgery, this was again involving the esophagus. It was in the mediastinum, but involving the esophagus such that they could not take it out. So they had to do a partial esophagectomy and create a gastric conduit, as, as you can see there. So this is certainly consistent with a mediastinal AVM. I think it's the first one that I've seen, or, or I should say a hemangioma, that I've seen that involves the esophagus in this way and is inseparable from the esophagus. But I think this description here goes along with what we see on imaging. Have any of you folks ever seen one that so intimately involves the esophagus? As you can see there. Oh, that's a great case. Yeah. So not very good. He did a really big operation to get that out. But very consistent with a hemangioma with esophageal wall involvement, as you can see there. Okay. So, Howard, the, the calcifications were dystrophic rather yes. than flea bullets, then, right? I'm just well, I think they're flea bullets myself. Pardon? 
Okay, I think these are fleeblets, is my judgment. Um, they're very round, look like fleeblets. Um, okay. Multiple of them. Um, that's my interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what biopsy they did before, but you know the whole the whole picture is that of a very vascular type lesion rather than any kind of granulomatous fibrosing mediastinitis, and by by surgery and path as well. I wonder. I wonder if there was delayed enhancement because you have to wait for a while with the for the hemangiomas to turn white. I think. Yeah, it depends how vascular they are. Yeah. All right. This one's just an interesting case. So. Here's a person um, who's been in a hospital off and on for quite some time, very ill, with a lot of cardiac problems. And for the current admission, uh, she came in looking like this, so alongside on the right-hand side. So the comparison is from the end of October, uh, when she was ill, but then discharged, coming back on the 3rd. After really a cardiac arrest, out at home, she was resuscitated. You can see that she has an endotracheal tube, a defibrillator, and she's got subcutaneous emphysema. But this is a case, I think I've seen one before, in which undoubtedly during the resuscitation, the right atrial lead was dislodged from the atrial appendage wall, and now the right atrial lead just hangs down in um, the heart. Obviously, she has other problems beyond just the lead. But just a nice example of a dislodged from undoubtedly cardiac arrest and, and resuscitation efforts of that lead that just hangs down into the IBC like that. So just an interesting case of that. I've Howard, seen that's, really, that's interesting. So you've seen that before in the setting of, of trauma, like resuscitation? Or with resuscitation, and I think I've seen it maybe once or even twice before in the context of I think a placement of an LVAD or some other device in which they've manipulated the heart in the operating room in such a fashion that the, the lead became dislodged. But I think I may have seen it once before in the context of cardiac arrest, I think. This is kind of just a, a funny kind of case where the history is kind of interesting. So why would I show a bone? Well, it turns out that this person um, was running away from the cops, and he jumped over some height and jumped over a wall, fractured his uh, calcaneus, was nabbed by the cops, and ended up in the hospital, at which time, uh, let's see if I have the radiograph, looks like this, which is pneumomediastinum, and then some subsegmental opacities in the right lower lung, but pneumomediastinum. Here is the CT showing the pneumomediastinum, but he's also got ground glass opacities in the anterior portion of his chest as well. Let me just bring up the thin cuts because I think undoubtedly the etiology of the pneumomediastinum is the Macklin phenomenon. So. Um, there were a couple of places in the uh, lung APCs that I thought I might have seen a few uh, black lines, like maybe or here, uh, black scepter and subpleural interstitial edema. And then we see air going into the mediastinum along the bronchovascular bundles. And then he's got these anterior lung opacities. So his tox screen was positive for all kinds of stuff like cocaine and meth. So I think in some fashion he's got a manifestation of some form of acute lung injury to his lungs from drug abuse, as well as presumably, again, in the context of drug abuse, we've seen cases of exhalation, presumably against a closed glottis, and the Macklin phenomenon and pneumomediastinum. So he's got kind of all of those findings, and the whole picture, I think, uh, is explained by, by drug abuse and and then running around. So positive screen for coke, cocaine and methamphetamine. 
as you can see there. Any chance that he might have had um, fat pollination <laughs> as a cause of uh, some of those micro-ground glassy things? I don't know. Oh, from from the calcaneus itself? Yes. Rector, I don't know if um, calcaneus rector like that can release enough fat that this might be a form of acute lung injury from fat embolism. I guess it's plausible. I'm just thinking the peripheral ground glass stuff uh, is is a good pattern for that. It could happen. Yeah, it's usually the long bones, like the femur and or large bones, like the pelvis. I mean, I guess it could happen, but yeah, we'll it's never not, know. But that that's a no. thought. Did he have any or other? I guess of pretty alter. Pardon. Does it say usually it's associated with the whole syndrome with the petechiae and the alter? Yeah. I don't think that I know of that he had any other findings that I happen to notice suggestive of that that I that I saw. They were really convinced and they still wanted to evaluate the esophagus for injury and that wasn't the case. In my experience often they, they don't really understand the possibility of a Macklin phenomenon um, in surgery very well as an explanation for pneumomediastinum. All right. This one is really quite interesting. Make sure I have the right one. Just give me a moment. Now hold on. Uh, this is a person with A history of amyloidosis and when he came in here he came in with a history of persistent airway amyloidosis having had about a dozen or so bronchoscopic procedures to try to remove and open up airways from amyloid deposition in the airways and I will show you here if we scroll down that in a couple places he has little calcifications related to airways. Um, this is the most obvious region right here in which there's clearly airway involvement by calcification, so consistent with airway amyloid, and right there. And the more I looked, the more I saw tiny foci. So the background is one of airway amyloid. But what's interesting here too is that he's got cystic spaces as well. A few of them like this one, super typical of the cystic spaces we see with amyloid deposition. So a really nice example of the combination of airway and parenchymal amyloid with cystic spaces from the amyloid deposition. And we can see here that he had the amyloid characterized as AL kappa light chain by mass spectroscopy. So a really nice case of uh, both parenchymal cystic and airway involvement by amyloid in this person. Mm -hmm. But his airway amyloid is the thing that's really bothering him, rather than the, the few cystic spaces that he has, like that one. That's interesting, Howard, because you know, usually what you read and uh, what you typically see, in the, not that you see it that often, but with airway amyloid, it tends to be confined to the airways. Right. Yeah, I think I've seen maybe three cases, one from Tarn, this is one, and maybe one other in which they do have what undoubtedly must be some parenchymal amyloid in my view at the same time. And the other so I, the usually with tracheoamyloid, it's pretty diffuse. Yours shows very discrete areas. And I think we've seen a couple cases in this conference where a single lobe or a few, just a few areas are involved. So you wonder if maybe the diffuse form is isolated to the airways in this patch here. Because you can see little, looks like little plaques on the trachea or areas of thickening throughout, but they're very lumpy, bumpy, and scattered as opposed to that diffuse circumferential thickening that we sometimes see. Yeah. I wonder if it's a different manifestation of it. I don't know. I don't... Uh, Jeff, I, I showed at least one where it was much more nodules and cysts in the lungs, but there were a couple of little calcified nodules in the airways as well. So, yeah, I agree with you. It was It was more of a patchy involvement of the airway with lung involvement, so... They definitely can occur in conjunction, but I think it's different morphologies. 
Yeah. Here's another sys down here. The right lower line. Interesting, huh? Yep. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if I have another one, or maybe I'll keep them for another time. Okay. Jeff, I'll keep mine perhaps for another time. Okay. Sounds good. Um, David or Travis? I have one case to show. All righty. Let's see, I think you just offered it to me, and I think I just eclipsed your little offer. Here we go. Okay. We see your screen. Yes. The world cannot see you scream or screen. Okay, this is the world's finest case of dip neck. <clears throat> this person has had the diagnosis since um, about 2006, had a biopsy at an outside institution that showed uh, this typical carcinoid morphology in these nodules. And the reason the person, this person got a biopsy was because there was a history of breast cancer many years before. It was treated with, um, I think, radiation and chemotherapy. So with all these lung nodules, people were worried about metastatic breast cancer. The biopsy revealed uh, carcinoid-like uh, cells. So we've got all these nodules all over the place and a lot of mosaic attenuation. No, we've not done expiratory views ourselves, but here's a set of expiratory views that were done at an outside institution back in, the, again, the 2000s. And it's not the world's best exhalation, but I think there is some degree of exhalation, and therefore this mosaicism here is indeed tied to uh, air trapping. It's not a, a perfusion problem. Yeah. So um, dip neck with... Um, Big nodules, in this case, lots of them, and uh, relative stability over the years, about 10 years of uh, relative stability of these lesions, and very nice accompanying air trapping. Very nice, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen one with that many nodules before. You know, we aim to please here. Mm -hmm. It's a very discerning and, and uh, you know, critical audience, so we, we don't come up half with halfway measures here. So you just got everything. You got the carcinoids, the tumorlets, the tumors, and the dip neck all in one patient. Yep. Okay. Yep. Right. That's a lovely example. That's it, Jeff. All right. Travis? Sure. All right. I'll show you this really quick. So this is from early days at Emory before I could even export studies to put into Osirix. Uh, but this is a patient with sickle cell disease and I had sent this one back to some friends at, at Mallinckrodt as a consult. And you can see these high attenuation lymph nodes in a similar location. And that's what I thought at the time. And, and one of my body attending said that they, she has seen numerous cases of this in patients with transfusion with just iron deposition and lymph nodes. So that's to go with, with Brent's case. So it can happen. And I guess he's in your Brent. Yours was myelofibrosis, you said, or some variant thereof. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one I I just pulled up and I'll show because it kind of goes with Howard's case of the esophagus. I don't have a radiograph to show, you know, because I, I it would be a really pretty but subtle findings. And here you see along the esophagus that you have this soft tissue mass with a lot of dystrophic calcification and this is more confluent in areas than what Howard showed and I think that helps to distinguish A, that it's not the fleboliths that he showed and B, you have a little portion of it here which I don't think yours had at Howard where it's more extending, it almost looks like it's extending into the lumen of the esophagus. It's a somewhat, what's that? Yeah, protruding in or... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's kind of interesting though. It's very it's it's fairly long and looks infiltrative. And um, going back as far as 2013, he's had that thing. Here's 2013, and it's you know it may have been minimally bigger on the current study, but he was lost to follow up for a while and came back with worsening dysphagia. But they recently biopsied this, and this was all just lyomyoma. It was presumably degenerating with areas of calcification in it. 
they haven't resected it yet, but this was they did several biopsies and it was all just leiomyoma, so they got just spindle cells. So I thought that was an interesting. Uh, it's the most calcification I've ever seen in a leiomyoma, and I thought it was an interesting companion to Howard's case. Yeah, that's really dramatic. All right. Well, much like David, I'm going to aim to please here. This is one that just came in this morning, so there's no there's no diagnosis yet, but I think we. We'll know what's going on here, and I, I want to show the radiograph first because this is a radiograph from back in this was in April of this year, and pretty generous pulmonary vasculature, and also you can see this convexity here, and when we look on the lateral view, that pretty substantial engorgement of the pulmonary veins in the left atrium, and especially when you compare it to 2007 and look at the lateral view, and look at the difference in this patient. And notice too that I think at this time, you know, you got you can faintly see the 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 fissures, maybe see a little bit of the the posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius, like a little bit of volume overload. Um, but this wasn't really picked up at the time when it was read outside. And then he came in yesterday. Frontal projection side by side, Travis. You said what the two frontal projections? Two frontal side by side. Oops. Yeah. Let me. Uh, Yeah, it's, let's, oh wait, uh, those are, there we go. Yeah, I think that, you know, you have this bulge here on the more recent one that's more apparent. Is there something else you were looking at? Oh, I was just trying to see whether I could perceive any distended pulmonary veins as such yeah. different from before, but I, I can't. You wonder, though, if you get a little bit more, I, yeah, I, it just, I mean, just I know talk. what's, yeah, I know it's what's talk. going on here, though, so that maybe I'm, reading too much into it. But here's his radiograph when he came in yesterday with okay. uh, he's had a couple months of worsening dyspnea. Now he's clearly got some interstitial edema. Yep. And um, they did a bedside echo in the emergency department. And here you can see this is his left atrium, left ventricle, and we see this big big sausage that's prolapsing through the mitral valve. And again this was just the bedside so it wasn't a real echo. And here is the CT and you'll see that one of the couple largest, presumably myxoma, it looks like it's attached to the interatrial septum. It's uni fairly uniform, low attenuation, prolapsing through mm. the interatrial septum, and then he's got, you know, some a little bit of fluid cuffs and a little bit of interstitial edema at the bases. Yeah, but so, he's got, he's got uh, dilated central pulmonary veins that are going into the lungs. So that's that's yeah. the that you were seeing on the lateral view was these pulmonary varices. Um, Nice example. Yeah. Yeah. And, Out of curiosity, uh, are his superior pulmonary veins as dilated as those inferiors going into the atrium? On the just on the on the CT. I know oh, he's recumbent, but I'm just curious. As yeah. To... No, it's no, it's a it's a good question. It's one of the reasons I want to show it because I think it's a very subtle radiograph. But let me mip it up and we'll see. That. The superior pulmonary veins, yeah, they're they're a little juicy, yeah. but not. On this, they're a little bit, yeah, they are yeah. a bit. Through. Yeah, even yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, they they're still waiting to do an MRI today. I, my resident's excited for them to do an MRI just so he can see what it looks like on MR. Even though I think that that's not really going to ultimately affect the the outcome of this, but this is. Do you, do you think you had some pulmonary hypertension too? I think so. Yeah. Well, right. So, like, yeah, probably just from from backup. Yeah, his his pulmonary artery is big, and so it's probably yeah. a group three pulmonary hypertension that they can treat with resection of this. Yeah. So. So, Travis, if you could you get so when you post this case, could you supply some uh, pulmonary artery pressure measurements, please? Because sure. this is an excellent teaching case where we talk about causes of pulmonary hypertension and you consider anatomically going everything, you know, the capillaries, the proximal pulmonary veins, the left atrium for tumor obstructing yeah. the mitral valve, the left ventricle, all these things that back up pressures. This would be yeah. an excellent example if we can document that his pulmonary artery pressures were high. Yeah, I will, I'll look and see. I don't know if they'll, I'm assuming they'll do a cath before surgery, if not just estimate it based on uh, echo, but yeah, I'll, I'll find what I can. Great. So, all yeah, right. Nice. 
And then, now this is a pretty cool case, and I'm going to show it. So this is, let me make sure this is the right, yeah, I'm going to show this one backwards. So this is a study I saw last week, and this is a lady who has undergone previous bilateral lung transplant, and I think at this time she's, yeah, she's 52, and so, you know, somebody that's, and she went, underwent lung transplant two years ago. Interestingly, she has a, an abandoned azagous fissure from the donor lungs. Um, Jeff will like that. So, and, so where's her azagous vein? Her azagous vein is... Well, her, her azagous vein should be normal since that was the donor lung that had the... The, the donor must have had an azagous fissure. Okay, show, so, us the, show us the azagous vein. Is it, is it there? There it it's, is. It's right there, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah, this is one that I read, and, you know, we see a lot of post-lung transplants, and it's not quite normal that there's a little bit of extra ground glass here, and I'll show you, first of all, the expiratory, and you'll see that there's some air trapping posteriorly, and so my, my resident was, you know, just going through the, the usual, which is some sort of acute infection or maybe some component of rejection. But then you look back at her most recent study, which was from June, and this is why I encourage, this is the old one, this is why I encourage my residents to, and fellows to always look at, you know, use all the information we have, and it looks considerably worse. You know, this one there's less ground glass. So we kept on going back, and you'll see, and actually here on this expiratory, there was not really much air trapping at all back in June. But we go back into, into May of this year, and you'll see that now it looks very similar to the current study. There's definitely some increased ground glass, and in some areas you can even tease out what look to be tiny little central lobular nodules, and the expiratory at that time looked more like the current expiratory where there was a little bit of air trapping, particularly in the dependent portions of the lower lobes. So that's what we were stuck with, and I wasn't content with just saying that this was, you know, that this was rejection or infection. We looked back, and then you'll see that going back to her original studies, we have as far back as 2008. This is pre-op, and again, we always look at those just because it gives us good examples of things. And you can see in her, she's got some upper lobe anterior fibrosis, maybe a little bit of honeycombing there, but again, this is an inconsistent with UIP pattern. She's got a lot of central lobular ground glass, some reticulation and architectural distortion. It's just she was biopsied at that time, to make a long story short, and this was hypersensitivity pneumonitis. You can see her wedge. And she had been using a, a spa or a hot tub two or three hours a day and, and had actually grown out MAI. So this was, this was hot tub lung, and it was chronic HP when they explanted her. And so knowing, knowing that history, we raised the possibility of this current study being recurrent hot tub or recurrent hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I actually didn't know her exposure at the time. And so they just bronched her last week. And sure enough, on her bronch, that they found more non-necrotizing granulomas and some organized pneumonia, and they think it is recurrent, hot, uh, recurrent hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And she's recently been using this like swim spa, one of these spas that you, you know, like a little hot tub that you swim in for exercise. And it's, you know, it's like a hamster wheel for water. So, um, so they think it's probably recurrent hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And we actually had a paper that that some of the other folks here published a few years ago, because there have been a few cases here of recurrent HP. I think this is either the third or the fourth now. Uh, but they found out of 31 patients with HP that two had recurrence out of this out of this group that they looked at retrospectively here at UCSF. So I don't know if you've seen it, but it definitely can happen. It's interesting because even though they're immunosuppressed, it can happen. And this definitely looks much more HP-ish on the current study. So. Wow. Wow. I think she's getting HP from a, sorry, I've, maybe I, I forgot the, the initial history, but now she's in a certain kind of a swim spa. And well, yeah, so it was, hot tub, yeah, it was hot tub lung before. Yeah, it was hot tub lung before, and they think it, it's probably recurrent hot tub lung, lung, some hypersensitivity to MAI. So. But she's in a different, she's in a different hot tub now, right? Yeah. She's really <laughs> Stay away from hot tubs entirely. It just takes water. It just takes water. Stick to that water and culture it and see what's in there. So, but 
yeah, so the, the take-home point is that it, while it is rare, it can occur. So I didn't know if this was going to be true or not, but it turned out it looks like it is. Now, let me show one more really quick, Jeff, if you don't mind. And I can't remember. Go ahead. Did I show you guys, did I show you guys this consult last week or not? Do you remember? Because I, I can't remember. I think we ran out of time. So this is one that my colleague Brett Elliker showed me, and we're both thinking along the same lines. This is a young girl. She's in her... 30s, as you can see. And um, here's her CT. This is back in May. She's got a, an admittedly bizarre pattern. You can see she's got some tiny little cysts. Some of them almost look like Cheerios and a bunch of nodules at this time. And she's also got chronic bilateral effusions. And we know they're chronic just because she's got tons of proliferation of extra pleural fat. You can see pleural thickening. And she's had a biopsy, which we don't have the results of here. But uh, this was back in, in May, and it's kind of a weird pattern. Some of these, look, like I said, look like cysts. And I don't know if she was acutely ill at the time, but she definitely has had these recurrent pleural effusions. And here she was on the more recent study. And now you can see that there are many more, or at least I don't know if there are more, but they're much more conspicuous, just you know, simple, uniform cysts. And so... I think some of these are pre-existing. I don't know if some of these nodules have evolved into more cysts or what is going on here. Um, but this was one that was referred to our ILD center. And Brad and I were both kind of thinking along the same lines. Like the first thing that came to my mind, could this be lymphangiomyomatosis with like chylus effusions? Um, I mean, there were other things I thought of. I'm just curious if anybody has any ideas because these do look like little cysts. I just don't know if they're all post-infectious or, or, or what, given that she had all those other nodules. Does she does he have a lot of mediastinal um, soft tissue infiltration too? Is this... There's, there's a little, like some sort of lymphangiomatosis or... Well, or I'm thinking lymph... of her and Chester. Does she have anything around her, Chester, yeah. around her kidneys? No, we, we don't have anything. And she's had a long history of recurrent pleural effusions over... You know, over like a decade or something. So, I mean, that's definitely a good thought, but I don't know. We don't see that far down. I just, I don't know. We we're kind of stuck. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, calcium or talc slurry that she has, and I'm just curious. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Pleural space and cystic disease. So, nothing abdominal at all here. Not, the, not that I know of. And, uh, yeah, just history of recurrent pleural effusions. And I don't even think her this, the lung disease is her biggest symptom. I think it was more just the recurrent effusions. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. She... Yeah, I was wondering even with some of these if it could be some weird form of like a, like a Langerhans or some sort of kind of along the lines of the Erdheim chest or some sort of histiocytic disease, but yeah, I, I just couldn't put it all together. Or mastocytosis or something like that. It looks like some diffuse infiltrating thing. Yeah, and her bones don't look that bad, because mastocytosis usually affects the bones too, right? I have not seen that, that many cases. I can't no, remember. The ones I have have, have sclerotic bone lesions or lytic bone yeah. So. Well, it sounds like you can I don't know. get that biopsy and tell us what this is. So yeah, they're going to hopefully review the biopsy and find it. So I just didn't know if anybody, you know, would in, like if you have an Aunt Minnie for this or something. So. She, uh, well, I will, I'll keep, I'll keep this one in the queue and hopefully find out what it is. Yeah, sounds good. And, uh, and David, that case I showed way back that you emailed me about with the young lady that had the either bronchiectasis or sarcoid, or we don't know. She still hasn't gone to lung transplant yet, so I still don't have an answer for you. But okay. uh, that one's still one I'm following. Good. So, all right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. I'll show a few. Let's see here. All right. Well, I'll show. Let's see here. I'll do this, and then I've got to do this. All right, so another one for David. Uh, this is another patient who shows up with cough fever, has consolidation in the right lung. Hopefully you're seeing a chest radiograph. Yep. It claims you are. Little effusion. Uh, wasn't getting better. 
got a CT scan, which shows the left diffusion and all of this consolidation. Um, no, I see you're, yep, you're seeing a radio CT. So it looks like an infection. And then there's a little filling defect here in the trachea, which I think most of us would not make much of. If I can move it a little bit there. You know, maybe some dense mucus or something. But it's a cool... <laughs> Uh, so this is blastomycosis, which um, I've shown lots of cases of. But this one's cool because uh, this is the bronchoscopy. This patient had extensive tracheal involvement. You can see there's all this redness and there's some plaque along here. And so that's a manifestation I've not seen is uh, pretty extensive airway involvement. Um, so, um, yeah, so that nodule presumably in retrospect was one of these plaques. But blasto can be pretty aggressive. And so, um, yeah, nice, nice case of that. All right. Um, let's see. I I showed you guys that um, gastric conduit that had leaked, right? I can't remember if I had shown it or not. Um, but let me. We got some more information, so maybe I didn't show it. Um, so let me show. Okay, maybe I didn't show it. All right. Well, let's 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 see. So this is a guy who had this off ejectomy, and he came in here about two weeks ago with this he developed a, a leak in his in his conduit had become obstructed and he ruptured into his pleural space and had this large pleural effusion they went in and repaired him but then he developed problems post-operatively and wasn't doing all that well and um, i'm going to show you this ct first then i'll go back and show the esophagram so this is post esophagram you can see there's a drain in here and let's see, we're seeing this screen. And unfortunately, we see contrast outside the staple line, outside the conduit. But if you see this, it's actually extending into the chest wall. So now we have an empyema necessitatis equivalent here. So a gastropleurocutaneous fistula. Um, and David, Chuck Rorman will like this. This is the esophagram. Let's see if they're showing that. And um, you can see the, the oral contrast come down, and it runs along the medial border. And so if you just contrast, you would see it going into the conduit. But what's important is this area over here. It kind of looks like the ocean. Let me see if I can put it on cine mode there. You see it looks like the waves of the ocean, but this is out lateral to the um, – there goes the, the contrast column. But this goes out lateral to where the conduit is. So this is that extra – conduit collection there and that's the important finding and you can see the collimation sort of hides a lot of that here's another image just showing you the, the sort of a natural air contrast you see all the barium or oral the water soluble contrast pooling more immediately and then this fluid level here is separate and needs to be explained and that's what it was the ct find so the ct was just done a couple hours after this this swallow and then they've ended up you know, here's his radiograph. You see this gas, and he had all this swelling in his chest wall. So they actually ended up putting a drain in, and hopefully this thing will close down. But he's got this big uh, conduit to pleura to chest wall leak. So that's kind of an unfortunate complication, but it happens with these conduits. So uh, when they first went in there, it had, it had a quite a sizable defect. It looks like it got obstructed and uh, didn't have a good blood supply. So they revised it, and it's just because it was already injured, I suspect it's not recovering. Very nicely. Okay, uh, here's some more interesting cases. Uh, so this is a six-year-old woman, and her history is she had a uh, tracheoesophageal fistula repaired as a child, and <clears throat> came in with some symptoms I don't know, but this is her CT, and you can see she's got a dilated esophagus, she's got a tracheal diverticulum, but right here, you can blow it up if you can't see it. There's a nice little it's a cute defect between the trachea and the esophagus and lots of air in her esophagus, which would go along with a fistula and some crud in her lungs, uh, probably aspirating a little bit. But what I like about this case is I, we managed to find on our packs the um, tracheoscopy or bronchoscopy images. And we'll go down and you can see this is the posterior wall of the trachea. These are the anterior rings. And as I keep going right there, you will see this little opening, and there's our little fistula. 
and what's kind of right there, you can see the secretions come right through it there. So this is a uh, right there, little tracheoesophageal fistula. I don't know why it recurred if it's been there for a long time, but clearly she's spilling stuff into her airway, and you actually can see the secretions right bubbling through. <laughs> Probably as she swallows, uh, some of the saliva and stuff is getting in, spilling into her lungs. Wow. Yeah. All right. This is kind of cute. This is um, a case, and um, let's see, this radiograph was right there, was interpreted as a possible abnormal, correctly, and there lies a possible nodule, and I'll show the lateral. You see it out posteriorly. And uh, so the CT was done, you know, when we, the CT history was evaluate lung nodules. So if we didn't give contrast, which for a nodule we normally wouldn't, but it's, it's a really cute finding here of this kind of curve, curvilinear structure, which is vascular. And it looks like a pulmonary pretzel to me, but this is just a giant meandering vein. We see it hook up into the inferior vein over there and it comes off a branch of the superior vein or of another vein here, it just crosses through the fissure. And you can see it has these little side branches. We don't have contrast, but it's a nice incidental finding of a meandering vein. I know we've seen several variations of that, but I've never seen a pulmonary pretzel before. So, uh, so Jeff, it comes from inferior pulmonary vein and goes back to inferior pulmonary vein, do you think? I think Just, it does, and I think it receives some supply of the superior segment. It seems to originate up here just above the, um, the, the lower lobe bronchus because there's the superior segment, and then it loops around, and as you follow it down, it hooks in to this inferior vein segment here. So I think it's just it's just a meandering vein or one of these loops. Uh, we don't know the exact flow, but obviously we're not going to further image it because it's an incidental finding. Um, it would have been nicer to have contrast, but we were doing it for a nodule. But you can see it on the radiograph, and in retrospect, you can kind of see the loop. And same on the lateral, you see this, it's more, it's not really a nodule, but rather a tubular structure. Good, yeah. It looks like an omega sign, that's really cool. Yeah, it, it was just, it's just kind of fun. Um, this is one fun case that we had the other day. Also, I don't have a contrast study, but in this case, we really didn't need it. So this was a patient who had a bunch of medical problems. I forget, it had something in the belly, was bleeding, and this was just done for dyspnea. And you can see, um, let me change the window a little bit. This, this high attenuation branching filling defect, let me make it a little less there, in this left lung. And you can follow it down into the left lower lobe. And then there's another one here in the right upper lobe. So we called this PE. Um, Ooh. I mean, it was pretty, I can put it up on a coronal, but it's, when you, when you look at it on the, on the reformats, let's say it'll go the other way. You can see it. Um, right, right in there. And they weren't going to do anything about it, so they opted not to uh, do a, another study or anything. But uh, I think it's real. We, the consensus around here, we all looked at it. We said, yeah, it's real. I mean, it's hard to make this into an artifact. Um, blow it up a little bit. Wow. Is it a little eccentric or something? Yeah, it looks or like a it's never a branch point. Something. Oh. Yeah. There it goes. You follow it down. Doesn't look as pretty on the Mac screen as I had it on a different screen, so you can you can play with it and see if you you believe us. Um, uh, let's see here, uh, and then this is uh, let's see, I showed that one. This is kind of cool case. Okay, so this is something we don't see a lot. So this is a young woman. She's in her early 30s, and I'll show you her. This is her initial CT, and I will share that screen. So she had at this point she presented uh, ill with this extensive lymphadenopathy, very low attenuation, uh, axilla, supraclavicular, as well as intrathoracic. And then on her uh, lungs, you can see she's got a miliary pattern of small nodules everywhere. So this is, uh, it turns out she has untreated HIV and um, also AIDS, and this is uh, disseminated tuberculosis. So she gets, so that was back in June, and then she had a CT on the 15th, um, which was follow-up. So now she's on heart and this follow-up and follow-up to see how she was doing. I'll tell you that the miliary disease is a lot better, but what's kind of cool is she still has all this lymphadenopathy. The axillary nodes got bigger. And then I'm curious what you guys think about the, the right hilum. So what we notice is she developed kind of bulkier lymphadenopathy in the hilum. And you can see there's mass effect on the middle lobe bronchus 
But what's cool is in the lower lobe, there's an endobronchial component extending in the hilum. Hmm. So we're thinking this is an iris type picture and we think this is all post obstructive. She's clearly uh, responding um, to the, uh, her T cell count is now over 200. Um, so she's clearly responding, uh, but this is kind of an iris like from the clinic. I talked to the ID doc and he thinks clinically she has an iris type picture. But I, I don't know, you guys ever seen, I don't see a lot of HIV, so I don't know or how to explain this unless there was lymphadenitis that had ruptured into the airway sometime between the two studies and we're just catching it now. Um, and as it's healing, that's what's kind of left of it as opposed to actually as a response causing airway involvement. It's, there's a lot of abnormality around all those bronchi. Yeah. It's, and there's presumably a sore lymph node involvement, but there's a lot of pathology there. Yes. And I think some of this is all post obstructive because that airway is kind of plugged up there. Oh, and I should go back to the original study also. She has, not only did she have diffuse uh, chest uh, lymphadenopathy, she had splenic involvement. They used some iterative reconstruction, so that's why the image looks so crummy, but this is not normal spleen. Yeah. Jeff, you wonder if that will will shrink into a calcified broncholith. Yeah, you kind of wonder because see here the yeah. see, there's all that lymphadenitis, but the airways are open. There was no soft tissue in the lumen at that time, so I don't know if we're just missing a data point and it, it, there was actually rupture into an airway, and now it's just as it's healing, it's becoming solid, or if the actual because of the acute inflammatory response it just undermine the airway wall, there's tissue damage, and now we have extension of that lymphoid tissue. And like Travis says, as it heals, and I bet we'll see a follow-up on her, as it heals, it will um, either calcify or, or protrude in the lumen or develop a fistula. So Jeff, what about the lymphadenopathy ulcer? Would you say the mediastinal and axillary nodes had decreased? No, they'd actually increased, especially in that left axilla. Okay. It gotten bigger, which you would you would you would expect to see with an iris type phenomenon. Uh huh. The so the, we were a little less. All the nodes are going in the same direction. In other words, the yeah. right hyalur. We, we weren't thrilled with the mediastinal nodes getting bigger, but I thought they were about the same to be honest. But the hyalur nodes got bigger, and the axillary nodes and the supraclavicular nodes. So most of them. So I would favor it being the systemic response. All right. So, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, time will tell. Keep an eye out on this. Wow. Yeah, and since I have it here, it's nothing particularly interesting. But I like. I think most of us like foreign bodies. Uh, this is uh, Daniela said she thought it looked like the state of Wisconsin. I don't like it, but I liked her second choice. It looks like a rooster. These are some dentures. You can see there's the bridge or plate, and there's the teeth there. But it looks like a rooster. So, Great. add to our list of aspirated or swallowed bodies. Was this person French? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, next week is Thanksgiving, and the week after that is RSNA. Um, if you guys are going to be around on the next uh, two weeks from now, uh, we could definitely have the conference again. I'll be here. So um, just let me know, and we'll decide whether or not to have it RSNA week. And if not, we'll do it the week after. Right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.